Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Tuba People TV, where we talk about Arnold Jacobs all of the time. Puddles and I are here in beautiful LaPorte, Indiana, with our old friend, Rich Watson. Isn't that something? Wow. It's been uh, since 1986 ish. Yes. Wow. Yeah. It's good to see you. You haven't changed a bit. <laughs> Um, As I uh, remember, Rich, Rich, uh, I met Rich first uh, in in Chicago when you came back to uh, Chicago uh, for studies, and you were had been in the Honolulu Symphony and yep. uh, somebody that I heard all about and <laughs> greatly admired, and uh, so here we are today. Um, I'm wondering uh, what can you tell us about uh, what first drew you to uh, Mr. Jacobs? Well, I was in high school in uh, Findlay, Ohio, and the band director at Glenwood Junior High School at the time, uh, a guy named Jim Mitchell, a, a terrific oboe player and musician in his own right, uh, first mentioned the name Arnold Jacobs to me and suggested that I seek him out, said he was in Chicago, and uh, I said, okay, well that sounds like a good idea. Um, so at some point I got up the gumption to call, some, I, don't, I don't remember how I came upon the number, but somebody gave him the number. And not knowing the protocol at the time, I just called whenever. I believe it turned out to be in the middle of the week or something, and of course, that's not when you call. Huh, right. I did get a hold of Gisela, uh -huh. and I was already a little bit nervous anyway, because you know who am I to be calling this great man up to, to, to seek an audience with him, right. even if it was for money. Sure. Um, and I didn't really know what I was getting myself into. So she starts asking me some questions and I'm getting a little bit more nervous and stammering a little bit more and she started asking me, well, what symphony do you play with? And I was getting really nervous because I thought, well, am I really important enough to call this guy up for lessons? So I said, well, I would, I'm just in high school and uh, the call ended soon after that and I didn't call back for four more years. What, what year was that? Oh, 1968. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that was my first attempt. Okay. Four years later, I had been going to school at Michigan and other people knew who this guy was and what the protocol was. So I was able to call him on the Sunday afternoon. And uh, of course, the very distinctive voice on the other end of the phone, hello and explain to him who I was. This time I had a little bit of credibility because I was actually at a university of, of uh, some repute with a, a terrific music school. Yeah. And now I felt like I could do this. It took, mm -hmm. as it always would take for new people to work their way in, two or three times before I finally got a lesson. Yeah. So the time had come, I selected a, uh, a day to drive over to Chicago with my mom uh, and we were going to go to a, a concert at Ravinia that night, so I wanted to combine that. We drive, drove from Ohio over there, and that was at his house on South Normal Boulevard in Chicago. So I at least had one lesson in the famous house. Uh, I do remember that we were up in the living room or the kitchen. Gisela made us some, some sort of, gave us something to drink or whatever, and listening to a uh, professional trumpet player downstairs, you could hear very, very clearly in the basement. Um, and then it was my turn. Uh, went downstairs and encountered the uh, the famous basement with uh, it was very dark and had lots and lots of magazines and newspapers and piles, and you had to negotiate your way a path through all that to get to another section of the basement, which looked like it had been a wash washing machine room or something, but we had a dirt floor. And I thought, wow, well, this is where it is, okay. And I remember I played for him some. I had a, a B-flat tuba at the time. And he listened to me play for a little bit, and then he says, well, I don't know if I can play a B-flat tuba worth a damn anymore. And he takes it, and of course, he's all over the thing. Uh -huh. And he gives it back to me and says, okay, here you go. <laughs> 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 but... Um, he just was talking to me about music and about 
uh, playing the mouthpiece uh, to as the first first thing after the brain to impart the music and to get a vibration going that you could resonate into the tuba. And basically that's what is that's what it was about. It was just about making music uh, through the instrument without buttons and transferring that to the instrument with buttons. And we went through some breathing things. At the time I was I was playing okay. I believe I was going between I believe it was between my, my sophomore and junior year, uh, just before uh, Michigan hired Dave Torchinsky to go over to be the professor of tuba. Oh, okay. So I actually started that before I started with Mr. T. Okay. Um, and I still, as I'm talking about this, I'm remembering very well what everything looked like, the outside of the house looked like, what the basement looked like, what the kitchen looked like, and right. just being with the man. When he played your B flat tuba, do you remember what you thought just as he was playing that your horn? I thought this is ridiculous. Especially after he <laughs> made that statement, I don't know if I can play a B flat anymore. And of course he was all over the place, just uh, a lot of um, noodling, uh, some of which was a, uh, I remember he was triple tonguing up and down some arpeggios on the thing. Yeah. And uh, those noises were coming out of my Marzan B flat tuba. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, okay. I guess I got a ways to go here, mm -hmm. but now I know it's possible. <laughs> yeah, and I suppose perhaps he was thinking uh, that's maybe the first part of the lesson is to let you know what is possible on your instrument. It came to that, yeah, yeah. But it was, it, and again, it wasn't uh, an intensively analytical lesson. It was mainly about uh, making music. Um, I don't remember what I played for him. But I do mainly remember that, him taking my tuba and playing a lot of stuff on it okay. and handing it back to me. Yeah. <laughs> said, well, hey, here, now you, you play. But it was a fairly successful lesson, as I remember, and uh, we went to see him play that night at Ravinia, and it was, it was great. It was a nice trip. Having the opportunity to start with, with, with Mr. Jacobs with some frequency, it was, certainly wasn't a regular kind of thing. It was, uh, I don't even remember how widely spaced the lessons uh, were. But when I had the opportunity and the time was right, I would go take with him again. Um, eventually, though, it was necessary because things weren't quite going right. Okay. When I was a freshman at Michigan, I remember Harvey Phillips came and did a, a clinic. And one of the things that he said was that there were people that used two or three different obishers when they played, and then it should only be one obisher. I believe this is very telling. It wasn't so much the information, but the way I interpreted it. Mm. I said, well, hmm, I think I, I might be doing that, so I should probably make my mouth be one obisher. That's what I'm thinking. So I started to do that. And things started to go south, because when you try to hold your mouth a certain way, and you get away from the music, then bad things can happen. And so I started for the first time not being able to be a natural player anymore. You know, when you go to college, you're made to think about things. Yeah. And yeah. when you think about things, sometimes you turn it on yourself. And you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But in college, you're made to think that you got to try to fix it anyway. So let's just say that after that I was a little confused and, and I was starting on my way to not trusting what I had done so successfully in middle school and high school and started going on a, a, a tangent of analysis, um, self-analysis, and I suppose you would say poisonous self-analysis without any real direction. and pretty much based on my interpretation of some information I was given from a very famous person. So in no way is it Harvey Phillips's fault that I may have gone off on this tangent. It's, and this is telling for later on, this is it's how I interpreted the information and applied it to myself. So there were some very frustrating uh, points in my playing career. 
Um, I did manage to be able to play successfully to a point, um, but there were other people along the way that did not have helpful information. Uh, I'm not going to name anybody, but... Um, is this after you were in Honolulu? No, 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 this is, this is still in school. Oh. This is, this is in school. Oh. This is way before that. Oh, okay. This is way before that. Yeah. I'm setting it up for what we may be talking about later, when this gotcha. became a full-blown phenomenon. Um, I did manage to get myself back into some sort of shape, and I played a, a, a pretty good and entertaining scene recital, and uh, worked my way into uh, the Honolulu Symphony job. I do remember, uh, I, one of the great things that, about the Torchinsky studio, well, a couple of them, one of which was very frequently, it would be almost like a master class situation, meaning he wasn't the only one, other one in the room. There would be other people sitting around in his room and everybody contributed. Mm -hmm. So besides Mr. Torchinsky, I might have Warren Deck and Dave Finlayson in the room. Mm -hmm. Might have Walt Desheen, who went on to become the tuba player in the Denver Symphony. And other people, John Griffiths was also one of them. Mm -hmm. And so everybody had something to say, and it was teaching by committee. And I don't know anybody else who would have allowed such a thing at the time. I thought it was really cool. Mm -hmm. We could just walk in and out of there any time, and we would find ourselves contributing, and you would get a, a, a more rounded education, I suppose you could say, mm -hmm. with uh, many different opinions, and again, blending the best of what you had. Now at the time I was still seeing Mr. Jacobs, and uh, part of what was trying to get me back into, uh, a away from function and into music, or at least the analysis of function. So that was going on. That was another reason for me to go to Chicago every once in a while. Um, so I, as I said, I was able to, to complete my, my senior year and get into Honolulu Symphony job. Things were fairly successful in Honolulu and uh, I was able to take some auditions. It's awfully expensive to fly, fly to places from out there. Yeah. Um, I took several auditions and after having been one for one, I then was after a while one for ten. But still was in the mix and was able to go to different places and, and participate in ensembles and whatever. For example, in the 1976 uh, First International Tuba Symposium in Montreux, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. I was able to play in some of the uh, pickup groups, I suppose you would say. I was participating in master classes and that sort of thing. I was pretty much in the loop. Um, fast forward. Um, around 1984 it was. There was a summer that I was invited to participate in a brass quintet uh, people mainly from the Utah Symphony uh, in the Sun Valley Idaho Music Festival. Uh, so in preparation to go out there I had a two-hour lesson with Mr. Jacobs and it was fabulous. Somehow there was a new, I just clicked with what he was saying for the best I ever had and I was on my way to playing the best that I ever had. Things took a few days to kind of work their way in but I do remember having a, playing with the Utah Symphony for a week of concerts, and that went very well, and going up to Sun Valley and participating in brass quintet. And I remember that we had a recording session after the festival was over, and playing some very difficult works of things that we played through the festival, and four nights of recording, I didn't miss anything. It was on. I wish that today I had a, a tape of that, a recording of that, because that's the best ever. Who knew, certainly not me at the time, <clears throat> that six months later I'd be wondering what happened. And that's about all it took. Um, <clears throat> it started out, actually it started out the last session. I had been away from the tuba for two or three days and when I got back in it, things weren't quite working right. So I tried to make them work right. The response wasn't quite there. It took me a little extra work that I hadn't taken to get that. So I tried harder to get that. I was able to do that. I remember it was during the recording of the Malcolm Arnold Quintet. 
and it was very difficult for me to start precisely on time with the note in the, in the second movement, very sensitive. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I didn't think too much of it at the time, but I remember we were doing a William Walton piece in the orchestra, had the same thing start to happen. Things were a little bit delayed. Not enough for people to notice a lot, but I noticed it. So what did I do? Well, I need to give it more air, which I did. And that caused it to delay even more. Wow, well, I better give it some more air then. And it delayed even more. Well, after a few months, it started not to respond at all. Mm. And I was in a space that, especially compared to several months before, I said, what is going on? Got to the point <clears throat> where I have to do a job and I have to fix things so that I can do that. People are starting to look at me funny, mm. wondering what's going on, and I'm wondering the same thing. It got so bad that I even called in sick for a youth concert that I wasn't really sick for. Mm. But it was just too embarrassing to go play because it didn't sound like anything. It sounded like worse than worse than I'd played when I was in this when, when I was in the seventh grade, I never played anything close to that. I actually played euphonium pretty well in the seventh grade. Uh -huh. And it never sounded that bad on the tuba, even when I first started the thing. Mm -hmm. And when you were supposed to be good, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and when your loved one says to you, I thought you were good, why can't you get a job in California? Yikes. Yeah, exactly. And you're already beside yourself trying to figure out how what's happening to me and how do I get out of it and you don't have in Hawaii you don't have anybody around there yeah there wasn't Skype right there wasn't anything like that although I I, I know that Mr. Jacobs would give lessons over the phone mm -hmm. it came to a point where um, I was trying to get I wanted to get a degree and I wanted to I found that Northwestern was only a year's worth of master's work so I arranged it so that I was able to be accepted at Northwestern to get my degree, but mainly I wanted to go back and try to get fixed. Mm -hmm. Right. And when when I met you, I was fully into this. Now that that summer, uh, I was substituting for Jim Picorni in the St. Louis Symphony. Oh wow! And I needed to make money, I wasn't going to turn that down even though it was hard to play. I managed to sort of pull it off, but they were starting to look at me funny. Mm -hmm. But I did manage to, to get it together sometimes and play some things. But, um, you know, it was, uh, boy, just try to keep it going so I can keep getting that page. I can get over to Northwestern where Mr. Jacobs would fix me. Right. And that would be back to normal. Right. So, um, I did that, and uh, at the time they were shifting him out because he didn't want to go up to Northwestern to do that. Right. There was some conflict there, and it was arranged so that I would be the only one out of all the students to get lessons with Mr. Jacobs. Everybody else would take once in a while with him, but mostly with Roger Rocco. Right. Um, so to uh, cement my participation, I remember sending him a case of pineapples. <laughs> which he remembered, and that's what reminded me of him that, oh yes, I was to get all my lessons with him. So that was nice. So when I got there, um, he realized that he should have taken me earlier. I was trying to get in to see him over the summer, and it never quite worked out because he didn't realize it was so messed up. And then when he finally discovered that, I said, oh, he has you might have heard this phrase, we got work to do. Yeah. So we started to go to work on things and it was really messed up. Mm -hmm. Really, really messed up. I was able to have some success, but again, the internal pressure to try to fix things. I think that's a, that's a theme, mm -hmm. trying to fix things. It was working against me. So you, you were taking your focus off the product of music and put it on trying to fix things? Well, it was trying to make music, but yes, it was trying to fix 
things. And I wasn't afforded the opportunity to, and I didn't really have the internal knowledge for myself to be able to, to work my way out of it. I heard him say these wonderful things, and occasionally I would get a really spectacular result for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Way earlier, you know, years before when I take a lesson with him, typically uh, I'd learn some things and I'd go down to the Grand Park Park instructor and play for about 45 minutes. I never sounded better in my life. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, you know, junk. it took me about a month to get back into that. Right. As you know, there's a lot of information flying at you with on particular themes, but still a lot of things that you think you have to remember. Yeah, sure. And you have to do every one of them or else it's not going to work, right? Mm -hmm. So again, my interpretation of this information may have been a little faulty and a little bit filtered. And I remember him saying that some people take my, my words not at face value and they try to filter it. And if not successful, apparently that was sort of me. Uh, nevertheless, I was able to play a recital. Um, and I remember I did the uh, Broughton uh, Concerto with a full wind ensemble on the pick stager, pick stager stage. Wow. Yeah, it was a tight fit. But we did that. Um, but and again, I had some some moments of success with things. I was able to to pull that stuff off. So I go back to Honolulu, and things are not still not. Everybody's expecting well, the way I was before, right? And it was worse. It was worse. Yeah. It but was you, worse. I was still I was still confused. But you had a successful recital. Or you played a recital. I played a recital and it was mostly successful, but it wasn't I don't think it was I think it was successful from pure will. More than a build up of uh, skills that would lead to a proper foundation okay. to take it from there and go I was still confused. So things continued to get to be messed up. That was a strike year. Uh, so I continued to stay in Evanston uh, and try to get um, lessons. And I remember the last one I got hung up because we were moving and I was late. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't thrilled with me at the time and that was that. Was that. So I went back, finished up the other months, and then I went back to Chicago to get more fixed. Mm -hmm. And at some point it became apparent that this, uh, this ain't working. And I remember that I had to, um, the, the, the Honolulu Symphony sends audition committees to Los Angeles, Chicago, and, and New York. Mm -hmm. And I had participated in two of those auditions, and I also, or committees I should say, and I also participated in something called a review committee. That's just when the musicians get fired, there's a committee of musicians, uh, fellow musicians that go over that and see if it's reasonable or not. And I was on two of those. And now I was the subject of one. How embarrassing is that? Mm -hmm. And it came time to meet up with the people and I was supposed to play for them and there was no way in hell I was going to be able to play for them. Wow. Not at all. So it was very, very weird going over there and just talking to them and knowing that I gave up my title, my identity. Mm -hmm. So after that happened, for the next two weeks it's okay, what am I? Who am I? I'm, I'm not anything now. Mm -hmm. And it was so, so, so strange to do that. Well, then I had to start living life as a normal person. I had three tubas at the time. I sold two of them. But I couldn't sell all of them. Typically what would happen is I'd have the one in the basement. And about three months, I'd go down and make some noises on it and put it away for another four months. Hmm. And that's the way it went for, for a while. Okay. You sounded terrific today. How'd you get there? How much? Uh, how many? How many digits do you have left on that thing? I'll tell you about that. Um, I was working in a bank and driving limos around Chicago, keeping a tuba mouthpiece with me, but being so tight of the knots, when I tried to play it, almost no sound would come out except for this really tight sound. Somehow, I was able to hook up with Roger Rocco again. So I got. I said I can't be doing this anymore and went over to his house in LaGrange at the time and he told me this is your liberation day and it really was 
he was able to, we'll say, simplify some of the complication depending on how you receive Mr. Jacobs' information. Mm -hmm. You can take it and make it complicated even though it's not complicated. But you can get yourself involved in all the minutiae on the fringe of the information and miss the main point. Roger Rocco was able to bring me back to the main point, which is his philosophy is sing, buzz, play. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's familiar, but he was able to, to simplify it so that I actually got it. And I didn't have to worry about my air, except to take enough. Mm -hmm. It was mainly about pitch awareness. I was able to get start getting pitches, pitches in the mouthpiece again. And it was able to start more and more sounding like myself. That's terrific. Yeah. And this was in the 90s? It was the early 90s. Early 90s, okay. Yeah. Um, I also started to teach lessons down at uh, down in uh, Frankfort, Illinois, one day a week. In order to do that, I still had my musicianship. I never lost that, which was the really frustrating thing because I had all the music in the world in my head and not a way to get it out. Mm -hmm. So, so frustrating. Um, having to teach people and having to eventually play for them, I had to get going. Mm -hmm. And something that really kicked me around was in 1996, I believe, I was going to play the very same Broughton concerto on tour with the Valparaiso University Chamber Concert Band. So I had to get things together to play that. Mm -hmm. And I did for the most part. It got to be successful. It took me a couple of tries on tour, but that really started getting me going. I started. I was working more with Roger and continuing on the Liberation Day. And one of the things he said was, it's never fixed. Right. It's never fixed. Mm -hmm. And to my way of saying it, you should not try to fix it, but you should try to play it, to play it in. In other words, when I was deep into this, well, Mr. Jacobs had a saying. Um, what was it? Uh, you don't correct what's wrong, you establish what's right. Yeah. Okay. So, as an extension of that, if you do something, it's not nothing. Except, if you don't make any sound at all. Mr. Jacobs would say, a, 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 a bad sound can be turned into good. Silence can't. Mm -hmm. So what I say is, make a sound, any sound, and you can eventually turn that into a better sound by playing it more right instead of less wrong. Mm -hmm. And a, a, a note to the music educators out there, work with the sound of the player instead of what the player looks like or what the player feels like or what you think his mouth should look like or his tongue should be doing or his teeth should be doing or any of that stuff. Right. Work with the sound. In other words, the catalyst, the catalyst uh, uh, vibration from the mouthpiece with a signal from the brain which is transferred to the air column in the instrument, whatever brass instrument they may be. Uh, Roger Rocco says that I don't play the tuba anymore, I play the mouthpiece with a tuba extension. Mm -hmm. What that means is, uh, Roger Rocco, by the way, deals with this kind of thing all the time. When you are going through this, you think that you're the only one especially at the time that I was dealing with it is before the term musician's focal dystonia became popular, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, it's the extension of the uh, paralysis by analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, you analyze the wrong things, you turn your analysis inside of you and it becomes poisonous, whereas I say now, anything that comes out of the instrument, analyze away. What was your sound compared to the sound it was supposed to be? Work your way towards that sound through imaging the sound and, and improving the image and, and coming closer. In other words, playing more successfully or more right. So you become a slave to the instrument. You pay attention to how the instrument feels. You pay attention to how your mouth feels. You pay attention to how you feel in general. Of course, Mr. Jacobs would say, I don't care how the instrument feels or how I feel. You know, you just you play the song. So you get back to music 
by playing the song in the instrument with no buttons. And you make the instrument the extension of that instrument with no buttons. It just so happens to have, to need buttons to make the different sounds. And so I've really taken that to heart, especially lately. Lately, things have gotten, I, I feel like I, I have recovered most of what I've lost and that I'm going to keep going and have, be even better than I was before. When people become a slave to the instrument, it's the enemy. And you can even have a physical sensation to that as you would to, to a restaurant with really bad food. Mm -hmm. You know, that similar kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know you have to do it because it's the only place around. You can't eat anywhere else, but you don't want to. And when the instrument that you have spent all that time with becomes the enemy, especially if you have to use it to play, to play a job, that's very difficult. Yeah. It takes time. You gotta put yourself in a position where you're not under any sort of pressure, internal or external. So you're allowed to work through the inevitable bad sounding parts, or we'll say unsuccessful sounding parts, mm -hmm. until you're able to get some sort of a, a core success and build on that. And, in, and like I say, it's, it's not about playing not wrong, it's about trying to play successfully. But yes, I, I feel like Things are getting back to what we call normal, but as Roger Rocco says, it's never fixed. You have to keep working at it. Mm -hmm. If you forget, if you go backwards, at least now I have the means to get myself back and I have the time to be able to do it. Um, but you got to give yourself time, lower your expectations, but not your aspirations. You want to keep your eyes on the goal, but um, you need to know that you might not be making the, the, the most wonderful noises on your instrument that you would hope for, but it'll get there eventually, you have to build it up. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where I'm at now, and I'm much happier and uh, ready to go on to the next chapter of music making on the, on the tube or whatever, whatever else, whether it's in the Laporte Symphony Orchestra, uh, clinic, solos, uh, in my, with my band together. Um, it's, it's fun again. Fun to do that. That's great. Yeah. Wonderful. So I, I, it's taken a long, long time, but let it take a long time. In the end, the product is worth it. Well, that's a great story, Rich. I really appreciate you sharing that with us. And uh, it was quite a journey for you. <laughs> yeah, it's taken only, um, what, uh, about 30 years? Yeah. 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 Well, with that in mind, and maybe something that you can. Uh, used to celebrate that later on, um, Puddles and I would love to give you this uh, genuine Tuba People TV oh, that's uh, so awesome. glass for your beverage enjoyment. Diet Pepsi, Diet Coke, or something. Water, or something. Or something. Well, I appreciate that very much, and I'm thrilled to finally have the opportunity to be on TPTV. I've watched some of the episodes. You're doing a terrific service for music not just Arnold Jacobs people, but everybody can learn something from any one of the interviews. Uh, it's good for research and just for general enjoyment and entertainment. Well, thanks. And you're doing a great job. Appreciate it so much. You bet. Puddles says you're number one. Thank you, Puddles. And now back to you.